Hi, my name is Jill Santiago. I serve as director for the Center for Social Justice and Human Understanding at Suffolk County Community College. By design, the history of oppression on Long Island is a series focused on stories often untold, not shared with students who live here, sometimes because of the hard truths we must face when confronting them. The truth is, Long Island has an incredibly rich, wonderful history, although not all stories of our history are ones we glorify. Today, I'm talking with author Claire Bellagio. Her book, Espionage and Enslavement in the Revolution, the story of Robert Townsend and Elizabeth, combines both aspects of our complicated past the incredible influence people of the region had on the American Revolution, but also delves into the reality of slavery, which thrived on Long Island, and on one enslaved woman's story in particular. In addition to her research and writing on this subject, Claire is currently establishing a 501c3 nonprofit organization called Remember Liss, the woman who we will be talking about today. Claire, thank you for talking with me today about your fascinating work. I've been really looking forward to our conversation because I loved the book. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So your research focuses on these two fascinating characters, right? Mm -hmm. Robert Townsend, who was a spy for George Washington, and then an enslaved woman um, named Liz, who is simply extraordinary, and I can't wait to have some conversation about her. But before we get there, I'm, I'm curious about how the book has been received since you've published it. It's really been received well by teachers, by community members. Everyone who hears the story wants to see more. Mm -hmm. They want the story to be told, and that's really what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my life, I think. I think that there's enough content in this book to do exactly that. I mean, yeah. your research is just absolutely amazing. It's so detailed and the stories are just just amazing. So I, I'm really looking forward to to what you're going to do with this with this next. Um, so like so many prominent families on on Long Island, the Townsend family um, held many enslaved people. Um, we know Robert Townsend eventually becomes an abolitionist. Um, but I'm curious about, you know, it, when we think about slavery, we don't really associate it with a place like Long Island. Can you talk about that? I mean, we think yeah. the Deep South when we think about slavery, we don't think right. about our backyard. So. And, and there's a misconception when people do talk about slavery in the North during the founding era that Northerners only had one or two slaves. You can find this written in a lot of books. And I have not found that to be the case in my research. Mm. So take the Townsend family, for example. For decades, people mistakenly said they were Quakers. And by calling them Quakers, then insinuated that that meant they had no slaves. But actually, 16 years ago, there was a document that was purchased by the museum that showed they had many, many slaves. And by the end of my research, I had identified 20 different individuals who were enslaved just in that one household. I mean, can you talk a little bit about who the Townsends were? I mean, these, yes. were, mm -hmm. these were a pretty prominent family here. What kind it's, of things were they involved with? They were wealthy people. The father, Samuel, and his brother, who lived next door to him, Jacob, had built five large merchant vessels in Oyster Bay Harbor. So they were shipping merchants, and these ships could travel all the way across the Atlantic to England, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, come back through the Caribbean and the West Indies, and bring large quantities of goods to the New York market. Right. And they were also farmers. They had about 350 acres of land in and around Oyster Bay where they were growing crops and raising livestock. So they were also very political. Mm. The father was a prominent patriot he had joined the New York Provincial Congress, mm -hmm. which was the satellite of the Continental Congress. Mm -hmm. And he was a staunch patriot on Long Island when most Long Islanders were on the British side. Mm. So he was really sticking his neck out uh, for the case for America to be its own free country. So many Long Islanders and many students who will be watching this probably know something about Robert Townsend mm. um, because of his involvement as a spy. But I'm curious, as you were researching him, I'd like to know about him as a spy, but also what other things you uncovered about his life that mm. students might be interested in. Well, during his own lifetime, he wasn't the chosen son, mm. right? He was um, pretty much on the down low when he was growing up 
and as an adult, uh, people were focusing more on his older brother, Solomon, who seemed to be the one who had made it in politics, made it in business. His brother was married and had kids and had done all the normal things. And Robert just was a bit of a rebel. He wasn't interested in showing up socially or politically, even though he had revolutionary ideas being against slavery. And so, you know, he didn't really tell anyone that he had been a spy for George Washington during his own lifetime. I suspect his father might have known because his father was so well connected to the Patriot cause, but he didn't want attention and he didn't want thanks. He just wanted to be left alone. <laughs> and I think in many ways, as an older adult, he saw that he had failed. He had really failed to end slavery in New York with mm -hmm. his group, the New York Manumission Society. Mm -hmm. And I think he felt depressed about mm -hmm. the lack of his ability to make a lasting change. Yeah, there, there's something about anyone who's fighting for change. Mm -hmm. It's never fast enough. It's never as yeah. fast as you want it to be. And there's always a struggle, you know, that can be um, defeating in a way. Well, he fought so hard to help Liz, and then he took his eyes away from her just for a short while, and she ended up having a terrible outcome and was sold south to Charleston and enslaved by a very violent man down there. Yeah, so that, that chapter alone, that story alone, mm -hmm. would certainly have made a tremendous impact on him, his psyche, his motivation for the work, all of it. Um, so, so you mentioned Liz. Mm -hmm. uh, what an extraordinary story this is. So. Yes. Where do you even begin with her and her life? I think we begin by just recognizing that it's unusual to know about the life of an enslaved black woman during the time of the revolution. Mm -hmm. We really only have a few examples of people of color that we can think about. Oni Judge, who was enslaved by George Washington at mm -hmm. Mount Vernon and who escaped, or Crispus Attux, who was um, killed in the Boston Massacre, and a few others but we only know about points in time in their life. We can't follow their life through an arc of twisting and turning events. And so Liz really is a standout in that way. And that's why I try to tell people that she is a new founding figure. People think about uh, someone who's enslaved as having no free will and no rights, and that's mm -hmm. certainly true. But Liz was so brave and so intelligent so courageous, she had a lot of agency. Hmm. So when she was around 17 years old, she escaped with the British. So the British Jeez. were offering slaves their eventual freedom if they could escape from their American enslavers and come over to the British side. And so Liz, who was already living behind enemy lines in Long Island, which was overtaken by the British, she met a very unusual commander named John Graves Simcoe, who himself was an early abolitionist. And I think through conversations with him, she had the courage to escape. And so during the body of the war, in the time when Robert Townsend was operating as a spy, she was right there in the same area that he was and might even have been helping him to get information about what the British were doing across Long Island Sound in spy letters that would eventually get into Washington's hands. Mm. So she eventually ends up being sold again. She goes back to Manhattan. She ends up in Manhattan and then after in Manhattan ends up down south. Mm. How does she end up there? So at the end of the war, she has this British enslaver and of course the British lost. So they all have to leave the evacuation period, right? Mm -hmm. And they usually would go to Canada from New York. Well, she came to Robert at his apartment in Peck Slip and said, buy me back. I don't want to go mm. out of New York. Well, Robert had already begun to have some abolitionist thoughts himself. He had hired a white maid to keep his household, who he paid, a woman named Polly Banvard. So he perhaps did not want to own a slave, but Liz was three months pregnant. Mm. And he had known her his whole life, and maybe he had really involved her in his spying activities too. So he took her in, he bought her back, and became her legal owner for a short period of time. He allowed her to have this baby in his apartment, a boy I believe named Harry. Mm -hmm. And then when Harry was about six months old, there was again another moment of Liz having agency she wanted to be owned by a woman she knew named Anne Sharwin, who was recently widowed. Mm -hmm. 
Liz wanted this, Anne wanted it, and Robert negotiated the transfer of ownership. He told this woman, if you ever wanna leave New York, let me know, and I will buy Liz and Harry back again at the same price. He thought that agreement was in place, but then once again, things went in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. That widow got remarried and the man she married turned out to be a horrible person who attacked Liz in some way that caused the whole marriage to fall apart almost immediately. He then retained ownership of Liz and the baby mm -hmm. and maybe out of spite or maybe out of greed, sold Liz south to Charleston and kept two-year-old baby Harry in Manhattan. So now she's separated from her child. Separated she's separated from, from, from the Townsons, really from everything, the, everything, that she, everything yeah. she had ever known in her life. Um, so I guess, you know, there are some, some stories uh, or too often we hear about white men saving black women. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this theory? And is that something that you think took place here? Do you think that that's what this story is about? Yeah, I would say that, that Robert Townsend is not a white knight. Mm -hmm. He did not come along and save Liz. A she of her own free agency escaped from his household. Now, if he knew about this or didn't know about it, that's kind of something the reader gets a chance to puzzle out on mm -hmm. their own. They were definitely in each other's presence in New York City during the time he was a spy. Um, so is she eventually reunited with her son? Yes, she was down in Charleston for two years. And then I do believe that they were able to bring her back up to New York, although there had been a change in the law that prohibited the importation of slaves over state lines. That had actually happened while she was down there. And so I believe they smuggled her back up. I found evidence of her back in Oyster Bay. That was where her son now was. Mm -hmm. Robert had taken that two-year-old well, when he took him, he was four years old right. from the Manhattan enslaver and brought that child to his parents' house in Oyster Bay. So she was reunited at that point in 1787. And I found a record of her still in Oyster Bay two years later. But then the following year, I believe she went to work in a mansion in what's now Massapequa, a uh -huh. large house called Fort Neck House as a paid servant. I believe I found her working there in the 1790 census. Yeah, she's listed there as many people who were free people of color who had no, no last name. Mm -hmm. She's listed as Free Elizabeth. And that's a very unusual document because, you know, if you have no last name and you have no home of your own because you've only recently become a free person, you're still living in many ways in an enslaved person's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So many free blacks were living in the households of white people, working for them, but in many ways still constricted in how much freedom they really had. And so in the 1790 census, you'll see a household name by the, by the husband's name, mm -hmm. and then beneath him, free black people listed usually only by their first name. What about the idea that Liz could be the mysterious female spy known as 355? What was significant about that spy and what leads people to think that Liz might be that individual? Some of the people watching this might have seen a recent movie called The 355 that came out this year. Mm -hmm. And this is alluding to a secret code that the Culper spies used. They had a long list of 700 or so words written out in alphabetical order, and each one of them was assigned a number so that the spies could use a number in the place of a word in their spy letters. So if the British caught the letter, they wouldn't necessarily be able to read what it meant. Okay. And one of those numbers, the number 355, meant the word lady. Now, everyone gets very excited about this because it shows that a woman helped the spy ring. Now, I've uncovered about mm, 300 or so of these Culper spy letters that still exist, and only one of them uses this number 355. But when this letter that talks about a 355 happens, fits very well with Lissa's story. So Abraham Woodhull, who was the other main spy, in essence, Robert Townsend's counterpart in Setauket, he writes that in New York City, there's a 355, a lady of his acquaintance, mm -hmm. who shall help outwit them all. Now, 
<laughs> That's a lot to unpack, but it's very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people have supposed that this 355 was a wealthy woman or a socially connected woman. But what if this lady was Liz? Mm. Liz had just entered the city. She had known the British spy, John Andre, through her knowledge of Colonel Simcoe in Oyster Bay. Mm -hmm. And she was living in a world that was British headquarters. The British had made Manhattan their headquarters in America. So if she was butting up against or moving through rooms where these important people were discussing things, her way of outwitting them was by mm. being invisible. Claire, I'm interested in how you met Tiffany Yecky Brooks, your co-author. Yes, I was so fortunate to have a co-author like Tiffany. She's a professional writer, mm -hmm. and she was helping to write another book about the Culp spy ring. And as a historian that was really like the authority on Robert Townsend, she had come to me several times asking me questions about what I knew about Robert for that other project. Okay. And so it was so important for me not just to have an amazing writer to help me, but somebody who already really understood the Culp spy ring. Mm. I really wanted a woman because uh, I wanted somebody who could really connect to Liz. Mm -hmm. And Tiffany had just become a mother at the time. And I thought that was so important to have someone writing who really could understand what it was like for Liz to be separated from her young child. Right. So Tiffany was perfect and I'm forever grateful for her talent. And then there's a famous name on the cover of the book as well, Vanessa Williams. How, how is she connected to this work? Amazingly, Vanessa Williams didn't just write the foreword to this book, but she's actually connected to the story. Her descendants are from Oyster Bay, where Lys was enslaved. She can trace her ancestry back to the same area where Lys would have been as an enslaved person. Wow, so yes. her connection is very, very personal. Very personal, to the story. yeah. Her ancestors may have walked along the road with Liz when she was enslaved Incredible. There. Isn't that incredible? About. Yeah, amazing. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Thanks. Claire, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today and helping us to understand another layer of local history that is so valuable. I want to thank you for your research and your writing. I hope you continue to do more. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.